Hey everyone, this is Jennifer Beamer, owner operator of Expertly Dyed Art by Science, and this is Fiber Talk episode number 14, and today we're going to be talking about North Reynolds theme. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about North Ronaldsey, which is a primitive sheep breed. And this one in particular is very near and dear to me because I do talk about it a little bit in my PhD thesis. For those of you who have followed me and my research over the last few years will know that I just recently completed a PhD in investigating textile production in Iron Age Britain. And one of the things that I looked at was wool. and Iron Age sheep breeds, which technically the North Ronaldsey sheep is an old breed dating back to the Neolithic period, so it was an apt thing to discuss in my thesis. Now as part of that research, I do have a lot of information that I can give you from the academic side of my background in today's video, and hopefully I'll be able to digest it so that you understand a little bit more about where the breed comes from and some information about um, animal husbandry practices over time, and I won't bore you too much with the technical details, so I may borderline oversimplify some of the research I present in this video, but I will also link the bibliography in the description below, so if you do want to follow up on this, you can. So the way I've structured this video is a little bit different than in previous episodes, mainly because of this amount of research. Um, but that's not to say that the Fleece and Fiber Source book won't be used, because I certainly will be using it. And um, it isn't to say that there is no in other information out there academically about these other sheep breeds, but because I don't actually research uh, prehistoric sheep breeds or even more modern medieval, um, post-medieval uh, time periods, there's technically a lot of information out there about these breeds in academia, but I don't personally research them, so I won't be able to necessarily go into that kind of background for those breeds. But for this one in particular, I could, and I wanted to present it to you guys today. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to do was present a little bit of information that comes directly from the Fleece and Fiber Source book. The North Ronald Sea Sheep is a conservation breed, and the fleece weighs roughly two to two and a half pounds. The staple length is two to four inches, a little bit variable in diameter, somewhere around 23 to 28 microns for the down. The locks are triangular, and they recommend washing the fleece, which I would agree with. And Jane and Peter Donnelly created a yarn from North Ronald Sea where you can buy bits of this fleece carded and dehaired, which is a really nice feature. Okay, so we covered a little bit from the Fleece and Fiber Source book, but I wanted to present some other information um, from a couple of hand-picked articles that um, kind of talk about how from the academic side we've sort of been uh, developing this research of Iron Age sheep. So I'll start with Michael Ryder. He wrote this um, article, The Origin of Spinning, in 1968, and in it he talks about his experience uh, spinning wool with a, a hand spindle and, said, and says that um, a 33 gram whorl is fine for a British down wool of medium diameter. However, for soe fibers, which is a close relative to North Ronald Sea, it was far too heavy a spindle whorl for that fiber. And he also mentioned that it was possible to spin it using a lighter whorl of about 8 grams. Now, he also goes on to say in this article that more research was required to kind of understand how all of these elements spinning and weaving kind of relate together for uh, prehistory. Um, but he did follow up with it um, in this 1993 article where he talks about wool at Danbury and uh, the textile production sequence there. 
This is where my research comes in. Um, Danebury was one of my case study sites that I researched. And having looked at um, the, the bone evidence of those sheep breeds found at Danebury and comparing them with the Soe sheep, there was a discrepancy in size. So when you measure to the wither, um, the ancient breeds were a little bit taller at that point than the Soe, and that was enough for Michael Ryder to suggest that the Soe more rep is more representative of the Bronze Age uh, sheep that might have been uh, available to producers back then, but something different for the Iron Age. So Michael Ryder has suggested that given the discrepancy in height differences, which do not factor into the sexual differences between males and females, um, that during the Iron Age there was a sheep probably like the North Ronald Sea, which is now more, it's found more northerly uh, in Britain. But it might have been more widespread during the Iron Age period because Danebury is in the southeast of Britain, so we're talking about a complete opposite um, location. So this is a very interesting point, and um, I wanted to also follow up with something else which some of you might have heard about. Seaweed. That's right, seaweed. This sheep breed is known for being the seaweed-eating sheep. In fact, there was an article produced in uh, 2019 literally talking about the seaweed-eating sheep <laughs> of the North. Um, so, Neolithic Orkney, um, there's a site there called Scara Bray, and some researchers looked at the bone remains of animals from that period and compared it with um, current examples of animals that have lived in that environment and oversimplifying slightly have found that the sheep from the Neolithic period had a very different diet than those of the modern period. Now in the um, conclusion section of uh, this particular article they found that um, the introduction of seaweed into the diet of the Neolithic sheep on Orkney was based more around seasonal issues of um, food availability. So during the winter, more of these sheep would be eating seaweed than a purely terrestrial diet of things like grass. And so when you talk about stable isotopes, and um, how these numbers change from the Neolithic to the modern period, you'll see how these animals adapted to eating the seaweed during the winter months to help them get through to the spring of plenty. Um, but after the Viking period, um, there was a change in animal husbandry practices that shifted these animals more into um, marginal zones and so their diets can be seen to shift towards eating more seaweed beyond just that wintry period. So yeah, it's an interesting um, revelation I think because if you don't have these sheep eating seaweed it helps you understand that these sheep might have been more widespread during the Iron Age period. And even though we don't have a lot of specific evidence or research on this yet, it does seem that Michael Ryder's point about um, an Iron Age sheep being more widespread that is more similar to North Ronald Sea might actually um, be represented in the archaeological record, we're just trying to work out all the details. Okay, so all of that background is out of the way, so let's actually talk about the fiber itself. Now this is some North Ronald Sea that I bought as a fleece, and 
due to being unable to drive, I just had to uh, trust the sample that I was sent to make sure that this is what I wanted to purchase. But luckily, the fleeces are quite small and they're very inexpensive due to the extra guard hairs in, in the fleece. So I think I ended up spending five pounds for a North Ronald C fleece. So it was definitely worth the investment for me. Um, being in the UK um, and having access to some rare breeds. Now, in terms of the wool, the undercoat is very, very soft. And you may be able to see that some of the guard hairs do stick out of the fleece. They're darker than the undercoat. Um, it may just be that um, the, the two fleeces I worked with had a lighter undercoat and uh, darker guard hairs, but I think that might be more of a commonality of uh, these primitive sheep breed types where the undercoat will generally be lighter than the guard hairs. One of the other things of note, um, you can pull out the guard hairs and just have the nice, light, uh, fluffy down stuff to work with. However, I remember reading something somewhere, probably Ravelry <laughs> in a forum. Basically, if you want to get to know a fleece, you should try and um, prepare it in a variety of ways and spin it in a variety of ways and knit it, crochet it, weave it to really understand why you might want to have it in this preparation versus that preparation. And the example that was used was Navajo churro. Now, Navajo churro is more familiar to the American audience because that's where those sheep reside, but I would also argue having worked with Navajo Churro in the past, that this isn't too dissimilar to um, Navajo Churro. So I decided rather than picking out everything of the fleece and having the guard hairs on one side and the fleece down on the other, I did a combined um, preparation method on my drum carter. The result is a sort of, it's a soft um, bat, but I can definitely tell that some of it is a bit prickly. Now, this is going to factor into how you prepare it for spinning, of course, but it's also going to influence the method of spinning. Now, in terms of actually spinning the North Ronald C, I encountered quite a few problems. First thing, I wanted to use my wheel initially because I don't usually have a lot of time to spin and it's a lot faster than hand spindles. However, I wasn't getting what I thought the fleece was capable of. Mainly, I wanted to make sure that the fleece um, having the guard hairs inside wasn't going to get um, amplified through uh, the spinning process. And what I found was happening with my wheel was I couldn't get enough twist and uptake where the yarn would stay together without falling apart and that it wasn't overspun so that the soft fibers got really compressed and it caused all of the guard hairs to stick out. That would have made a very prickly yarn. My second go-to option is my drop spindle, my handy dandy lace spindle. And in total, it's 17 grams, and I figured if I wanted to make something that was a little bit loftier and softer, that would be the tool. And it was not. <laughs> I didn't have the same problems with the drop spindle that I had with the wheel, but I wasn't really maintaining that amount of softness and the loft that I think this fleece really required. So I had to go with my third option that I am very much not proficient with. So my third option was to use a supported spindle and I got the results that I wanted. Now I do talk about this a little bit in another video, which I will link to somewhere above. And if you're not familiar with this type of spindling, basically 
because the weight of the whirl um, is being supported by a table or a bowl or some kind of surface, um, the yarn that you produce with it doesn't have to have so much twist that it holds itself together and bears the weight of the whole spindle apparatus and the yarn that forms on it. So um, by removing that need, I was able to produce a very, very soft and uh, lofty yarn. The other thing was, um, I didn't have this uh, prickly yarn um, by spinning it supported, but I did get a really nice like halo effect. By producing yarn with the supported spindle, I was able to emphasize the loft, which is what I was going for, but I didn't have to suffer all the prickliness from having the guard hairs be left inside. So what I get is a really visually distinct type of yarn where it's mostly white, but I have with some of the guard hairs, um, the kind of range in color from dark brown to kind of a caramel honey brown. And um, because of that, um, it doesn't look just monochromatic in the sense that it was just white. The second really great thing about using a supported spindle for this type of yarn is that the single didn't need to bear the weight of the whorl, uh, nor did it have to be strong enough to support the tension of the take up of the wheel. So the single itself was very softly spun, and by slightly over twisting the ply, I was able to produce um, a two ply that is slightly more rounder in cross section than a traditional two ply might be. And even though I used um, kind of like a supported worsted style backwards draw for the, the spinning, um, so it wasn't a true woolen, um, it is going to be warmer than had I spun it with either the wheel or the drop spindle. Um, it's not going to have a very distinct structure in terms of um, the visibility of a pattern, but that's kind of what I wasn't really going for, so it didn't really bother me. However, if you do want um, to do pattern work with North Ronald C, it might be worth something considering that if you're going to do some patterned or color work with it, that it might um, become indistinct, which could be very, very nice. Um, but if that's not what you anticipate, if you want really nice clear stitch definition in your pattern, then this might not be a really well suited wool for you. I did a quick calculation uh, of the total yardage that I did spin. It's only 1090, which isn't quite enough for a sweater, especially for me because I'm slightly more broad shouldered than I think a lot of women might be. Um, so it may be a cardigan at the end, I'm not sure. I also haven't decided whether or not I was going to dye it. It can be dyed like most white fleeces can be, um, although the guard hairs won't take any of the dye. so there's that to consider. But I don't know if I want to dye it. Some of you eagle eye watchers might note that these are not the same color. Why is that? This was a Christmas present. This is something that I bought for expertly dyed so that I can put it in the shop. This is sort of a, a light brown or like khaki tan color. And I did something to enhance um, the softness of this one because this fleece, this animal, wasn't quite as soft as this animal was. And that's one of the things that you might have to concern yourself with if you are going to buy a North Ronald Sea fleece that there will be f different fleece qualities from animal to animal because as a primitive breed their fleeces haven't necessarily been improved for the market. So um, if you are interested in buying one of these fleeces it might be better to get it from someone that whose opinion you can trust or um, possibly 
get it in person. I realize that's a big ask, especially if you live in the US and they're mostly in the UK. And traveling right now is kind of a disaster. The point of this is to emphasize that it doesn't always have to be completely 100% pure. Now, this feels very similar to this, and the way that I managed to improve the softness quality of this without destroying the nice um, distinction between the undercoat with the shorter hairs and the outer coat that has the longer hairs, I blended it with a little cashmere. In total, I probably used about 10 grams of cashmere, but it was just enough to really enhance the softness feel of the fiber. Because I was concerned that if I were to spin it without finding a way to enhance the softness of the undercoat, that I would produce a yarn that I wasn't really in love with, and because it takes me so long to spin with a supported spindle, I didn't want to go through all the effort to spin it, ply it, and then not know what to do with the finished product. With these primitive braids, it's really not straightforward how to work with them. Sometimes you just kind of have to go with your personal experience, and sometimes you just gotta test out some ideas. By testing out the various tools that I had, I was able to arrive at a tool that produced a yarn that I was gonna be happy with. If you are in this situation and maybe you don't have a supported spindle, maybe you just have a drop spindle, one of the things that you can do is consider which aspects of this wool you want to emphasize, and if it does mean adding some other wool that will help with the structure, blending is totally a viable option. If you had never told me that cashmere was added to this wool, I wouldn't have thought that cashmere was added at all, <laughs> to be honest. It's surprisingly soft, and um, because uh, I, I think I carded it about three to four times to, to get the um, cashmere to blend in with it. Now cashmere is a longer staple than um, the North Ronald C. So in the end, um, I could probably spin this with a drop spindle and it would be fine, but you could also use something like that as well if you want to um, improve the way it feels without sacrificing anything about the texture or the color. Those are my thoughts about spinning North Ronald C. Have you spun it before? What are your thoughts? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Did you try something different? Are there other blends that work really well with it beyond cashmere? Because Cashmere is kind of expensive. <laughs> I know I say this a hundred million times, but if you haven't already, please give me a like and subscribe if you haven't already, and post any questions or other comments below, and I will get back with you. And as always, thank you for watching. Bye!